Welcome. What we're going to do today in this relatively short video is show you how to create a lengthy password that qualifies for any number of the frameworks that are out there and also allows you the ability to easily remember it. This is something that we've put into practice for years and we call it the use of phonetic segments. Um, we knew that what we were doing uh, resided in a, a methodology called phonetics, um, but we didn't know that it was called linguistic phonetics. Um, so that's what we're using in order to generate our passwords. And we're going to get into that a little bit later, but first we're going to talk about the, the frameworks and uh, their recommendations and some of the recommend recommendations that have been deprecated. So let's get started. Okay, the first thing that we did uh, when coming up with a methodology or a scheme to creating passwords for cyber defense contractors as a company uh, was to look at what humans are capable of retaining in their memory, um, how they might be able to retain or recall a password. So obviously we as humans retain different memories in for varying amounts of time. Um, there's short-term memories which last seconds to hours, there's long-term memories which last for up to years. And then there's also this thing called working memory which lets us keep something in our minds for a limited time by repeating it over and over again. We've all done this with passwords, pins, maybe even a phone number. So our focus is on this working memory and the long-term memory for the sake of recalling passwords. And we want our passwords to enter what's called our non-declarative or implicit memory. You can look that up. Um, and it, in that location of the brain, is, it allows us to be able to recall something without much of a thought. Without much of a thought. Um, so this is akin to what might be termed muscle memory, a term you, you might be familiar with. Okay, uh, so some password requirements actually make matters worse. Um, that's what the NIST determined. So they have deprecated uh, at least two items from uh, what was their password requirements or password recommendations. So the NIST notes that the random algorithmic complexity expected of users is making matters worse. Although it requires a mix of special characters, numbers, uppercase, lowercase letters, symbols, uh, it appears to be resulting in weaker passwords. And how, how can that be? Well, users are replacing characters with comparative numbers. By comparative, we mean they look like numbers. So, for example, if you have the letter E, someone is using the number 3. If you have the letter I, someone is using the number 1. So this effectively decreases the security this rule was intended to create, so they have thrown that out. Okay, the NIST also notes that the periodic password reset requirements, for example, every 90 days, is so short that folks are actually creating weaker passwords because they know they're going to have to change it in another 90 days. So it's taking folks longer to actually recall their passwords without having to write them down uh, and the 90-day requirement is just not, it, it doesn't suffice. The NIST also recommends screening your passwords and that's something we've always done or we've been doing for a while now um, and we do it against a list of compromised passwords and we're going to show you how to do that a little bit later. Okay, so what is our password strategy as cyber defense contractors and what do we integrate into our written information security programs? So we use this password screening technology we were just talking about and we use it wherever possible. Uh, we use it if we generate a password, we want to see if that password has been part of a compromised list or part of a data breach and we'll look that up. Uh, if we're developing an application, we advise that you also use this uh, password screening technology via an API to 
uh, verify whether someone is entering a password that is uh, a known uh, dictionary attack or a known uh, exposed password in a breach. So, so this verifies that your password is not, has not been exposed in a breach. And we'll, again, we'll show you how to do that. So you want to implement password expirations likely yearly rather than at monthly intervals. So every year request that uh, your user change their password. Um, and if they're implementing what we have as a complete strategy for a password, then there's, uh, there's no issue with having to change it yearly. You do not you want to use you do not want to use dictionary passwords, whether it be the English language, or the Spanish language, or the French language, or the German. Language, no matter what language it is, you don't want to use a password. You don't want to use a word in your password that comes from a dictionary. And your password should be unique for each platform, service, or account that you use. We know you do not do this. We have been guilty of of not doing this. Uh, years back, but we no longer do this. We use a different password for uh, every uh, account, service, or platform that, that we use. And that's something that you should be doing, as hard as it is. As it is. But we're going to show you uh, at least two methods that make it easier, and, and one we're going to talk about right now. So you want to use a secure and encrypted open source password manager to keep track of your passwords. Make sure it's encrypted. That's essential and make sure it's open source. The benefit of open source is that you can go and review the code on a platform such as GitHub as long as that code is, po is, is posted there um, to review to see if it has any vulnerabilities. Uh, these are often, re it's often reviewed by the open source community. Um, so if any password manager did have a vulnerability, um, there would be an alert for that and it would be mitigated. So you also never want to accept when your browser's offer to remember your password. You want to disable that feature, whether you're using Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Vivaldi, uh, Opera, and there's a bunch of other ones out there. No matter which one you're using, you want to disable that feature. There's no need to have your password stored anywhere besides this open source password manager. Why have your password stored in your browser when at some point in the future, your browser could be attacked or a cyber attack may take place against your browser and it may reveal those passwords. So that's something you don't want to do. You want to target implementing a password with at least 20 characters. We know that sounds like a lot. We agree it does. But using this linguistic phonetics or phonetic segments, we're going to show you how to create a password that is uh, relatively easy to remember, but still maintains a, a length of at least 20 characters. So this can easily be, be achieved using linguistic phonetics and incorporating what we've deemed a phonetic segment and non-comparative alternative characters such as symbols, numbers, generate uh, to generate a lengthy complex and secure password so five phonetic segments can easily be remembered and can result in about 20 characters or more um, so we recommend that you create a password with five at least five phonetic segments if you can you want to go to a, about seven phonetic segments because that's typically what a human can actually remember um, but what we do as a minimum is five because that typically results in a password length of about 20 characters. So if you manage a system or you're developing a system, you want to allow for at least 10 attempts before locking out an account. Um, 10 to maybe uh, 12 uh, attempts is satisfactory. Uh, you don't want to go too, too much higher than 10. And then those password hints or questions that you are typically asked, those should not be implemented. Uh, the NIST makes that recommendation, typically because they are too easy to guess. And then these one-time passwords that are sent over SMS, those are also not recommended. Uh, SMS is not encrypted. Uh, you don't know if your phone has been hacked, um, so somebody could glean a uh, PIN. Um, that's sent over SMS to your phone. What you want to use in place of that is an authenticator application, and there's, there's a number of them out there that you can use. Okay. I think we're going to show you how to generate... Yeah, we're going to show you how to generate 
a qualifying and secure password. By qualifying, we mean it meets cyber defense contractors' uh, uh, recommendations or requirements that we integrate into our written information security programs. Okay, so here's a compliant password. <clears throat> now, I've got these caret symbols to show the phonetic segments of the separation of the phonetic segments. And I've also used different colors as well, so it's, uh, it's easily seen. Um, so there's one, two, three, four, five. We have uh, five phonetic segments. You might say we almost have six because of this pound in the number eight. Um, but for all intents and purposes, we've got five phonetic segments. It totals 24 characters, which is, uh, which is, which is great. That if you can achieve something along the lines of 24 or 25 characters, your password is that much more secure. And that's the purpose for using these phonetic segments. Uh, it's easy to remember, and it also creates a lengthy password. So we've used no dictionary words in this uh, password and there's no comparative character to number replacements. So we haven't replaced the letter E with the number 3. There's no letter I in here, but if there were, we wouldn't have replaced it with the number 1. So I'm going to pronounce these uh, non-dictionary phonetic segments uh, just so uh, just to show what they are. So we have the non-dictionary word HAPE spelled H-A-Y-P-E, and you'll notice we use a capital H and a capital P. Uh, we have another non-dictionary word or a phonetic segment uh, that's pronounced croon. That's not a word. Uh, we have a pound symbol, uh, the number eight, and then the non-dictionary word kimper, and then the non-dictionary word uh, that we would remember phonetically as tufts, um, but it's the number two, uh, the uppercase letter U, F, T, S, and then a second, what we in our mind would uh, would call a, another S, or which would be the uh, the uh, the uh, symbol, for the dollar symbol for the U.S. dollar. Um, so again, there's no dictionary words and there's no comparative character to number replacements. So this is a methodology that you uh, want to use. Uh, this is what we would recommend uh, or require if we were to write a written information security program for your business. Um, so uh, we suggest that you, uh, that you consider using this uh, going forward as you create your passwords. I think now we're going to show you how to screen your passwords. So there is a website uh, that maintains I believe half a billion um, passwords that have been part of a breach. Um, so you can look up your password and see if it has been part of a breach. Um, so you would use the uh, password menu option. Um, you can also look it up by your email address. You can also look it up by your domain. And uh, they have an API that you can, you can also use if you wanted to integrate that into a system. So the way this is pronounced, this word right here, is have I been owned, although it's spelled P-W-N-E-D, it's have I been, have I been owned, and that is the, uh, that is the website you want to go to, HTTPS, have I been owned, P-W-N-E-D dot com. Uh, actually, right here, it shows the number of owned accounts, and that's in the billion, so it's, uh, it's 9 billion uh, owned accounts. And, uh, and it looks like there's been 135 million paste accounts, which I would assume is the number of uh, people who have actually come here to verify whether they're uh, whether they have been owned and their password has been part of a, a breach, data leak, um, or anything like that. So, uh, so that concludes our uh, presentation, and here are some sources. We used the Nat uh, National Geographic to learn a little bit about humans and, uh, and the characteristics of their uh, short-term and long-term memories and their working memory. Uh, and we also used ABC News uh, to do the same. Um, so there's two uh, websites that you can go to to learn a little bit more about how, how, human, uh, how humans' memory, uh, memories operate. 
Uh, so, again, that concludes our presentation. We'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach us at info at cyberdefensecontractors.com. Defense is spelled with an S. However, if you do spell it with an E, we'll, with a C, we'll, we'll also get that, uh, we'll get that email. Uh, thank you, and have a nice day.